Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our June 2019 Teaching and Learning for Student Success monthly webinar. Uh, we are excited. This is our first webinar of the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, please remember that we will take a break in July, and then we'll start back up in August. Um, I just want to go over a few housekeeping things uh, for anyone who is joining us for the first time. Um, so please do know that um, all attendees come to the webinar muted. Um, if you uh, are having trouble with your audio, you can come, if your computer or um, audio microphone is not working, you can also call in um, by changing your audio selection to phone call. When you do that, it'll provide you with a phone number and an, and an audio pin that you can use um, so that later on in the presentation for Q&A, you can also um, participate using your audio and I can unmute you. During um, the presentation or during Q&A, you can pose a question by typing it into the questions pane. Um, if you send a question um, during the presentation, we'll hold on to it during um, until we get to Q&A. Um, and then if you do have a question during the Q&A period, if you'd like, you can use the hand raise feature so that I can unmute you and you can just ask the presenters the question yourself um, so that we can have more of a dialogue and more of an exchange. Uh, during college announcements, I will unmute everyone so that we can all participate in the conversation. Um, if you do have some ambient noise in um, the background, um, well, I just ask that you uh, mute your mic again. You can do that by clicking on the microphone icon, which will be green. And if you mute yourself, you can uh, it will turn orange to show that you are muted. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen where you can see how you can join us on social media. So you can find us on Facebook at Catch the Next and on Twitter at at Catch College. Um, we like to, as much as possible, try to continue the conversations that we start in these webinars and in our webinar series. So if you want to use the hashtag TLFSS chat, um, that shows us that you're continuing that conversation and, um, and we'll be happy to um, you know, pick up on any um, loose threads that are left after the webinar. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, and um, so we will have it up on our YouTube channel, and we will also uh, be sending it out to all of the um, summer 2019 Asunder participants. So in today's webinar, uh, you're going to hear from myself and Dr. Rafael Castillo. Um, and this webinar is a follow-up on the session that we did on um, culturally relevant pedagogy in the summer seminar. Um, so we're calling this culturally, Cultural Relevance Remixed, Materials, Lessons, and Assignments. Um, and we have uh, done this follow-up webinar for a couple of years now. This will be our third year. And so if you want to see some of the resources that were offered in previous years, you can go to these links. So rebrand.ly slash CRT resources. That'll be the webinar from two years ago. And rebrand.ly slash CRT dash redux, which will be the webinar from last year. And I'm going to pop out of the presentation quickly to show you that you can also just go to YouTube and search for Catch the Next Culturally Relevant. And those two years worth of webinars will be the first results that pop up for you. So um, in the one from last year, Dr. Castillo and I uh, talked about some different materials that you might want to check out. And I had also talked about a couple of different assignments. And in the one from two years ago, uh, we were really looking at resources that would span across disciplines. And so we're going to continue that practice this year. And without further ado, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Rafael Castillo, who um, is going to be talking about some of the culturally relevant materials he has used in his English classes. Dr. Castillo? Thank you so much, Lydia. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I teach English at Palo 
model of the college in INRW courses that we just had the next in 2012. And I wanted to talk about how some of these books that I use in my classes have been very, very, very successful. The students that have uh, enjoyed them have talked about, they still do when they, whenever I meet them, I will really talk about a particular book. And the book I want to talk, two books I want to talk to you today about are uh, Coats uh, Between the World and Me, and the other book by Raina Grande, which is uh, uh, The Distance Between Us. Now, this particular book by Tanahasi Coates is so relevant right now. And, it, and it, this, is a, this book is just like four years old. And it's so relevant right now because of what is happening right now in Congress. Yesterday, uh, Juneteenth, at, at the baby day, was Juneteenth. And Mr. Coates uh, gave a, a speech to Congress to talk about liberation. And uh, a lot of the material that this book covers is a letter to his son. So when we introduced the book, when I introduced the book to class, uh, I, had, I was using four books, and this is the first one I used. And we decided, I decided to break it down by chapters. So I assigned the students, uh, broke it up by chapters, and each student was assigned a chapter, and I told them, I want you to look for strong lines. What are the strong lines for you? What, and that's one thing that we emphasized that catch the next is when they read the material, they can look for lines or words or paragraphs or sentences that resonate with them, that they can see, they, they can feel something, something truthful about them. And this particular uh, book, it really, really resounded with them because a lot of them felt that, especially the first line, uh, these, are, these are all lines taken from the students. And I'm gonna, this particular uh, book is about a letter to his son, and it's cautioning to be careful that uh, he's not aware that uh, in American culture, the black body can be viewed as dangerous. And he tells his son, you have to understand that, uh, you know, uh, the world is not what you think it is. Um, and we talk as students, we talk about that. What, what, how do you feel about going into other neighborhoods? How do people look at you? So we talk about that. Well, let me give you the three quotes that, that, that we use. And these are the quotes taken from uh, the book. The first one is, the classroom was a jail of other people's interests, while the library was open, unending, and free. So we talked about that. You know, I asked the students, how was your experience in high school? And the majority of the students tell me, well, in high school, sir, it's not like college. Here, we're opening up, we can talk about it. Well, in, in high school is basically the one to get you out of real quick, it's fast. It's all rain, you go to another class, you listen, you take notes, you don't ask questions because it interrupts the flow of knowledge. It's okay, okay. Uh, and uh, do you remember anything else about your high school experience? Well, we read books that were told we had to. This is supposed to make it simple. Okay, okay. So, so this line, does that resonate with you? And some said yes. To me, classroom was a jail because I, I was not, uh, I was being fed information that was not, uh, that was not really, they didn't interest me. Okay, well, that's why you're in, uh, okay. So what, why did you decide not to go to college? Well, because I want to learn something different. I want to learn. Uh, I want to read, I want to understand. And I want to be a better productive um, individual. Okay. So the uh, the library was open and undeniably intrude. We talked about that. And so the students begin to uh, read quotes, understand the issues involving in being a young black man in today's society. And uh, we watch a, a short film. We watch a short film on quotes in an interview, and then we break up into small little groups. And by breaking up into small, those groups, we begin to explore uh, the content of the, of the book. Now, all the students have their own chapters. So when, once they begin the presentation, uh, this, this, this entire book was used for one month. So it took a whole month, whole week, with, with chapter by chapter. After each chapter, I would have little uh, questions, uh, reading exams, and so that they read uh, quizzes, actually. And then at the very end, 
they begin to begin the writing process. And the writing process all centers around these strong lines that they selected. Because I wanted them to select the strong line. Then I wanted them to tell me why they were strong lines. Then the second one really resonated with students because we had a good discussion about it says, but race is the child of racism, not the father. What does that mean? And I, I, one of my students said, sir, I think it means that, that, that we are born uh, without racism, but we learn it. So we start talking about that. Uh, children, how you grow up, what you hear. And then from there, we begin to, to create our worldview. So we talked about that, the students wrote about that, and then they, they talked about biases. How is that different than racism? So those are fine questions that we discussed. The degrees, degrees of racism, degrees. And, and students always ask us, oh, what is the difference between prejudice and racism? And, and we talked about that, and, and a lot of students, you know, uh, very carefully walk through that and they and I ask them, can, can you tell me something about yourself? What issues do you have? And they opened up. It's one of the things that I wanted to stress in the, that particular class is for them not to be affiliated with uh, Because I know we're taught to be rational, to, to look at things very objectively, but we're human beings at home and we do have emotions. And we have to learn to grapple with the emotions and be able to control the emotions. Be able to know when when it's properly critical and when it's not properly critical. The third one we talked about was uh, this last one where I have here. It says, but all our phrasing, the words we use, race relations, racial chasm, racial justice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy, serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience. And usually right there are students when I say, I like this word visceral. What does it mean? It means gut. And they say, you're right, it is. And you notice how uh, the students tell me, I notice that we use it in terms of the body. That's correct. He's using that as an analogy. And he says that it dislodges brains, blocks airways, rips muscle, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must never look away from this. And uh, the students then, they begin to ask questions about the body. And I said, well, what, what do you think he means by the body? And usually I have students who say, I think he's using it as a metaphor for all of us, because we're all, we all have bodies. And this great body called the United States uh, is in itself uh, a living, living uh, species. And usually another student chimes in and says, it's like the Constitution, it's a living, document. Okay, so how does this fit in with this about race relations, about racial chasm? And then they start, some students will usually will say, I think this deals with the meaning of the Constitution, but all men are created equal and we're endowed by the Creator, and the idea of hopefully uh, living to pursue justice and, and, and uh, justice and, of course, the now, uh, the study guide. So every classroom, every student does a summary presentation. I got four students to each uh, chapter, and then the, they begin uh, presenting the material. They've got PowerPoints. Each PowerPoint has a material that they use, and uh, after they finish, the Q&A starts. And usually that takes uh, a good 10 to 15 minutes of talking, raising questions. And by then the students have already bonded. We can talk about this openly. And then the writing now comes. That's the last part of this is the actual writing. They write a five page paper uh, work cited. And uh, usually some, like all students, sometimes I get students who go a little bit more and they say, you know, uh, I really got carried away. I, I mean, I've got eight pages, it's fine, it's fine. So the papers themselves, uh, we go through the writing process. We do the writing process. We do teach writing as a process. So they get a chance to read their material aloud to each other. We do grammar checks. Uh, we do transitions. 
uh, when I use in uh, one of the weeks, I, I, I ask for volunteers who like to volunteer the paper so they can project it onto the screen. And usually I have a couple of employees. And by using that, that method, uh, the students get a chance to read someone else's response to these questions, to the questions that I give. And I think I, I told uh, Lydia to go ahead and uh, pass out some information. I think I've got some, some uh, handouts on questions. And when they yes, do I, I'm sorry, I wanted to just jump in because I, I forgot to mention it earlier that um, if you all look in your control panel on uh, your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a section with handouts and there are five handouts in there and one of them is called, it's a Word document that says Castillo Lesson Between World and Me. Um, so you can look at that and I'll just go ahead and open that here so you can see yeah, these are some of Dr. Castillo's discussion questions. Yes, those are the for this questions. book. And, and, and I use this basically for them to write their papers. And, and then we do MLA style, uh, their response. And, and I get a lot of good papers, visceral, really, really uh, gut oriented papers that, that really they pour out their emotions. And then we talk about, about control. How do I control this? Because in writing, you can get a little bit out of control, and I explained to them what an out of control paper looks like. And then I want them to, to look at this with the thesis, uh, evidence, and then response, and then analysis. So we do that. Uh, when I get those volunteers, the students you know, have their paper on the screen, and, and, and they read, and then they ask questions. Then after that, after that, uh, at the end of the, at the end of the, then I give them the, the exam. I usually have, uh, I, I'm very big on reading exams. I, I know some people don't like that, but I do. I like reading exams. So I have all the materials listed and I try to ask the students, so, you know, what prompted uh, the Hassan coach to write this? And he talks about his friend, his friend, Prince Jones, who passed away. Then he talks about other, Trayvon Martin, other characters. That have, that have had issues, other other uh, individuals who have, who have who have who have died because of the body and uh, issues with that. So uh, that that's basically what I do in this particular book. Uh, it's a very profound book, and I think it's very apropos now because he's got several others, and I think it's a good uh, starting point if you want to read some more of this material uh, on the Hasi Coach. The second book. Can we move on to the second? Okay, yeah. This this book is also very apropos right now because of immigration. So these books, you know, they're they're books that I used before, and this book I used in my INRW course. All right. So the first one is 1301. This is INRW. It's written very easy to read. It's uh it's about a young girl coming. To the, to the United States looking for her father. Her and her sister uh, paid a coyote. They went through the, through the beast, that, that train, and they, they went into uh, the, uh, El Paso and then they made it into, and then finally she looked for her dad. And the, the entire book uh, is such a beautifully written book. It's written very simple. The students, it, it catches their attention immediately. And uh, it is about her going through this odyssey to find her dad. And uh, when she finds her dad, of course, the family drama is in this particular book. Next slide, please. Uh, is there a next slide on this? Is there a, a material that I passed out on this, on Lydia? By any chance? Yes. So. I have. So I went ahead and put your uh, group work discussion question there. Um, and again, if you're looking at the handouts, um, you will see the group work for Reina Grande. Go ahead and open that up. This is a Microsoft Word file that you can download from your handout section. Well, I've supplied several of them. And, and uh, uh, this particular book resonated with me because it's about a child, uh, it was a young, Reina Grande was a young child and uh, she went through a lot writing this book. Uh, she's got 
two novels. He's got another book out, and uh, he's on PBS. And he's got his websites about it. And we invited her to class. Cat uh, Phoenix uh, invited her. She came to my class, and the students really opened up. Uh, one of the things that they asked, I would say 80% of the students had this question. Did you forgive your father? Did you forgive you? And we talked about the role of forgiveness. How is it different from acceptance? Uh, as an adult, how do we understand the ambience, uh, the ambivalence we may feel toward our parents if they make mistakes? Is it better to forgive or to accept? How important is it? Uh, to process these feelings before our parents pass on. Has Raina fully processed her feelings? If so, how can we tell? If not, how can we tell too? So the students asked her, and she she kind of she was very surprised and she says, Yes, I did forgive them. Uh, I cannot carry this weight, this guilt with me all along. And it gave the students uh, a chance to write because uh, a lot of the students, uh, all families have issues. And the student had an opportunity to write about this. And it was a cathartic moment, it was a very cathartic moment for a lot of them. Uh, the book is very easy to read. I had uh, the, the student selected their strong lines. And from there, they read in small groups. Another student selected his strong lines or her strong lines. And then they explained why. So this whole process of reading, uh, active reading, I call it, takes uh, basically two or three days. They're, they're reading, they're discussing, uh, they're writing, uh, and then they're responding. And a lot of them, uh, I asked them, what sections of the book resonated that you find more appealing? And a majority of them said they liked that part when uh, Reina Grande talks to her cousins and they have this big party and then the next section is when she begins to have a boyfriend because now she's in the United States. She's become a citizen and she's learning the language, she's learning languages. And uh, and right there they share they share stories about uh, meeting different, having different challenges in school. And right here I, I, I tell the students uh, as a child uh, what I went through. Usually I like to also show and tell. And I, I, I told the students that uh, when I was in uh, uh, First grade, second grade, I came home, I was real happy, first grade, and I told my, I lived with my grandparents, and I told them, guess what, Willito, my grandpa, what? He says, I've got a new name. You have a new name? What do you mean you have a new name? He says, my name's no longer Rafael, it's Ralph. And they, I mean, everyone just started laughing, and my grandpa did not think it was funny. So we talked about naming, we talked about naming, we talked about, uh, what happened to Reina at the very beginning? You know, your name. What's your name? What does it mean? And uh, the students already know what it means. A lot, of, a lot of them are bilingual. And then we talk about, uh, I asked them to, to think about well, their name. What's in their name? And that's when I use, this is INRW, that's when I use uh, uh, the assignment on what's in the name. So that, that, that's very important. It kind of dovetails into the distance between us. Uh, I had a student, a very enterprising student, who said, I like the title of the difference between us, but do you think, sir, she was talking about us, meaning the United States, the difference between the United States, and it, man, it just clicked, and everyone started like, wow, Marco said that, and, and he was very happy that he said something profound, and I, was, I said, that's a great idea, Marco, uh, between us, yes, I think, I think, I think a case can be made that uh, Reina Grande is writing about us, writing about the United States, writing about her experience, her cultural experience. And uh, I got a chance to email uh, Reina Grande about that, and she, she laughed and she smiled. She says, I never thought about that, but that's, that's possible. So uh, these, these two books have resonated, and they, they're easy to use because they complement it, and they are basically culturally adapted because they deal with what Lydia and I talk about. Uh, all through life, we've always had the window where we look at other cultures. We read other other types of uh, uh, experiences. Uh, I'm a fond reader of Shakespeare. I love reading Shakespeare. That's, that's, that's the window. But 
now we I tell the students now we're gonna we're gonna use the mirror. We can look at ourselves. We can look at ourselves. And I think that's very important. A lot of the students really enjoyed that. There are other two books that I use, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about them. Maybe next time we'll talk about six mirrors and, and another book by uh, uh, Mr. Uh, well, he'll come to me. Later. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Castillo. And um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end um, that you can talk about um, some of the things that you're doing with those other works. Um, I also wanted to show everyone that um, in your handouts, you also have, um, oh, excuse me, you also have um, this annotated bibliography that Dr. Castillo and I updated last year. Um, so it has the full table of contents here, and there are a number, I don't know how many, <laughs> actually, but a large number, over a hundred um, different um, uh, materials, different sources that you can use, and each entry um, has been annotated by Dr. Castillo and myself. Um, so it just gives you a brief description of what um, what each work is about so that if it's one that you're not familiar with that maybe you can um, just kind of review to the description and see if it's something that you can use in your class um, or in your classes. And we've also put next to it in parentheses um, which courses we think it would um, each source would be relevant to. Um, the other piece, let's see, the other a document related to uh, the distance between us that you have in your handouts is uh, these discussion questions. Um, so, and it's broken down by book and chapter. So, um, these are really useful as well um, as, you know, that we don't have to, you know, as instructors, we can still create culturally relevant classroom spaces without reinventing the wheel. Um, so, these are really, really useful as well. So, thank you so much for that, Dr. Castillo. Okay. Uh, and I wish I had more time because I wanted to talk about films and how you can use films on these. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, if we have time um, during Q&A, um, I, I hope that you do raise some of those. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of assignments um, that I have been using in my classes for um, this first one, digital storytelling, I've been using this for a few years now. Um, and I've used this one in um, rhetoric classes, in composition classes, in, um, I've also uh, done a workshop at, uh, among, with sixth to eighth graders, a summer arts workshop where we did uh, digital storytelling, uh, some of my colleagues and myself in Houston. Um, and now, most recently, I use this uh, as a project in English 1302 at Austin Community College, where the curriculum is for English 1302 is focused on um, narrative analysis and short fiction analysis. So, uh, but this is a great uh, way to actually open up and get students to open up to telling their own stories. So the digital storytelling is um, a process-oriented uh, way of creating a three to three and a half minute video that tells a story about some aspect of your life. Um, and so uh, you can find more information about it at storycenter.org. I should say, full disclosure, that I did go through um, a full Story Center workshop when I was at Houston Community College. And so that's kind of where I got the background for this. Um, but I've also now led workshops of my colleagues and things like that. So um, if you're interested in digital storytelling and it's something that you want to bring to your campus or to your department, um, we can chat about how we can um, try to make that happen. Um, so you see here, this is from the digital from the Story Center website. So you, these are just a few of the themes um, that they have. And basically, at Story Center, they go honestly all around the world, um, and especially where populations have experienced trauma, and they lead digital story uh, telling workshops. So I just wanted to um, kind of give an overview of the process. Um, and when I do it in my classes, I stretch out this process over weeks. Uh, last year when I did it in um, 
comp two at ACC, I put it to the end of the semester, like in the last probably five weeks or so of the semester. And it was sort of a, became kind of a capstone project. And we had a big um, showing of each of the digital stories at the, you know, on the last day of classes and things like that. But it was actually this first step in the process, the story circle, where um, I realized that when we were in the story circle, uh, which is a safe space where students have about um, five to eight minutes to share their story ideas, um, that this incredible bonding occurred in the classroom. Um, and this is after, you know, the students had already been together for and in their familias and everything for um, around what, like six or seven months by then. And so they had already known each other and, you know, formed their bonds in their familias and things like that, had already taken, you know, all their first semester classes together. But the entire dynamic of the classroom really changed after we had uh, the story circle. So I decided this past year to move it up um, to the fourth week of the semester. So we actually start the digital storytelling project um, much earlier and it becomes more like a semester long project. So the story circle, as I said, is a space where each participant, so each student has an opportunity to share the ideas that they're thinking about for their story. And they get feedback from others in the group. And there are very clear um, and pretty strict rules that the space is a space of respect, um, that it's a space of confidentiality. So everybody agrees that they're not going to go talking about someone else's story outside of class or outside of the story circle space. Um, and there are even particular ways that we give feedback. So for example, instead of saying, I think you should do this, um, we all practice giving feedback by saying, if it were my story, I would. Um, and so each student um, usually will give kind of like two or three ideas. Sometimes they already know right from the beginning what story they want to tell. And then in that case, the feedback is more like, okay, well, how will you have images for this? How will you, you know, do this? How, you know, so asking kind of questions about the actual composition of the story and the telling of it. The next step is once the student decides which story they want to do, then they draft a, a narrative. So the digital stories, are, and if we have time later, I'll show you an example of one from the Story Center website. Um, but basically they use still images, photos, um, and the photos are all put together with a, vo with a narrative voiceover and, um, and in a video format. And so the first step is to write the voiceover. And I encourage them just to free write at this stage. And then they submit it to me. This is actually one where we don't go through the traditional peer review process that we would go through with essays and things like that. Instead, they submit it directly to me and I give them feedback about um, kind of the, the arc of the story, um, the audience to the, consider the audience and things like that. And um, it's an, this is another great way for them to, especially since um, for ACC, English 1302 is all about narrative. It's a great way for them to get involved in constructing a narrative so that then they begin to also see how some of those narrative elements play out in a short little video format like this one. So then I review their narratives and provide feedback for revision. Then they revise and resubmit. And once they get the OK from me, then they do an audio recording of their voiceover. Um, and with this, uh, many of them have like a voice memos or like audio recording device on their phones. Um, if they don't, I offer for them to use the voice memos function on my phone. So we find a quiet space and um, let them do that. Um, and so then at that point, they have the audio file. Um, the next thing that I do is I give, I usually take about half of a class day or do maybe like a 20 minute introduction or so of video editing processes and software. Um, like for example, uh, students that have YouTube accounts can 
edit and do all of the editing for their video in YouTube. Um, and I provide them with like some video tutorials for how to do video editing and things like that. There's also another uh, free video editing platform called WeVideo that they can use, or if they already have some kind of video editing app like iMovie or something like that on any of their devices, then they can use that. Uh, it is also worth talking to your um, IT people um, and or your learning lab uh, folks at your college to see what software is available on the campus computers as well and whether it's cloud-based or not, which is huge because these files are really big while you're working on them. So I show them some techniques, like I show them how to import their files, their photos and their, uh, their voiceover file. I show them how to um, expand the, the duration that, a, that an image will be on there, how to edit, how to cut and splice, um, how to uh, incorporate animation into these still images. And those are the basic things. And then I'll either have a lab or we'll do kind of like a DIY lab in the classroom where I'll give them the rest of the class time to kind of play with the different technology and software. So that takes at least one class day just to focus on that. And then um, from there, outside of class, they begin um, compiling their still images and their voiceover narration into their video. Um, and it's usually around three, no more, or two and a half to three and a half minutes is um, a good time. And then I didn't put this on here, but the very last step of the process, which is super important is, and it's important to disclose this <laughs> early on, is that we have a huge showcase at the end. So everybody, and it really um, closes the circle. Um, and so what we started in the story circle um, really kind of gets fully completed um, in the showcase. And they all really enjoy seeing like how their little kernels of an idea that they shared in the story circle have been sort of, you know, come, come to full bloom in their video. Um, and they all, they, they, turn out they come up with some really amazing amazing things um, I didn't want to include one here because I don't have permission to share them um, and but again I said like I said if maybe if we have time later in the webinar I can show you one from the Story Center website or you can you're welcome to go there and click on stories in the top right corner to view any of the videos uh, the other reason I wanted to include this is because since this project is um, so it does take up so much time. Um, I think it would be an excellent practice to be able to do it across multiple classes. So um, I've also had uh, many like history professors, uh, government professors who have also gone through the digital storytelling workshop and they've incorporated it into their curriculum as well. So it can be used across a variety of disciplines. And I think it would be interesting to think about which parts of the process you could do in, for example, an EDUC 1300 class, which you could do in an English class, or which you could do in the INRW component of a co-requisite and which you could do in the history or government or something like that. But seeing how you can crosswalk the different components of this assignment. So um, the next assignment um, that I wanted to talk about is a creative adaptation assignment. It's one that I have um, only recently started doing. Um, and it's also one that I use in English 1302. Um, but the idea behind it is basically that um, it converts students from being a student of literature or a student of history or a student of government to being a writer, a historian. Um, and so it, it has this self-authorship um, effect that, um, that I think is really, really important for kind of rethinking the classroom space and you know who are the authors and who are the creators in the space um, and who are merely the students. You can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes around the word merely. Um, so this one is, um, uh, basically what I have students do, and I bring this up, I'm bringing up the, this PDF to show you the actual assignment, and this is also available in your handouts for download. 
Um, but basically what students do for this is they select any short story that we've read over the course of the semester and they do a creative adaptation of it by either doing a spin-off on the short story. So they have to pick one narrative element that they would change from the short story. Um, so they could change the setting, for example, they could change a character, they could do a backstory for a, a character that they want to know more about, or they can write a screenplay adaptation of that story. Um, and so the, you know, those are their options. Um, I've had students do uh, really, really incredible things with this assignment. So for example, uh, one of the texts that we read is a short vignette from um, Tomas, Rimer, Tomas Rivera's eh, Cuando, what is it? I mean, the earth did not devour them. And this, the short vignette is called Cuando Lleguemos, When We Arrive. Um, and this particular vignette is about um, some migrant farm laborers who are in the back of a truck that has broken down on a road in probably like Kansas or something like that. And um, it's all their voices and their thoughts and what they're thinking and it describes and they're all saying when we arrive, when we get there, we'll all do this. And so it kind of expresses their hopes um, in this really dire situation. So I had um, several students that wanted to do an adaptation of that story. One of them changed the setting from um, migrant farm workers in Kansas to um, what was it, to the Berlin Wall or to East Germany um, during the time of the Berlin Wall. And so he did all this research on, you know, what was going on in East Germany at that time. And so he changed the whole setting and it's, it's instead of a truckload of farm workers, it's a busload of workers who are going from East Germany to West Germany. Uh, so I mean, that's the kind of thing that, that they come up with. Also have uh, several sci-fi adaptations of that story. Um, there's another story by Lorraine Lopez that we read um, called The Tatting Man. And it's about um, a guy, his wife has died and he sort of begins to assume her identity. Um, and uh, the other main character is his English teacher. Uh, and she has um, all these issues with her abusive boyfriend. And so I had a student who took that story and uh, turned it from, instead of his wife dying accidentally, he had um, killed her and started assuming her identity. And instead of Regina being the um, English teacher, she was actually the detective on the case. And so this student started researching all of this like forensic psychology and things like that and actually ended up writing an incredible short story. The other thing about this assignment is that it's really long. It's one of the longest papers they'll write. And so, um, but then but, and they see that and they have no problems with it. So they're writing like 15 to 25 page screenplays for example, uh, where they're like complaining about writing a six page essay at the beginning of the <laughs> semester, um, but they get really into it. Um, so some of the um, benefits to creative adaptation assignments like this, and I wanna challenge you to think about how you could do a kind of ad adaptive project like this in your own course, is that um, the students, whether they realize it or not, are learning analysis by imitating and adapting the stories. So one of the main reasons I wanted to talk about this assignment is because what I saw is students who were literally in my office hours crying because they couldn't, they didn't understand narrative analysis. And they had ACC, they have to take a final exam that's an analysis of a short story. And uh, it's a required departmental final. And so I have students who, at the time that they're about to start this essay or this short story adaptation, they're so nervous, they're so worried, they're like, I don't get it, I just don't understand. Sometimes they're having trouble distinguishing between rhetorical analysis, which they've done in the first semester, and narrative analysis. And then after they do this assignment, they just completely ace the final. Um, and even if they're anxious going into it, they, they, the results are incredible. 
Um, and it's because like it's very abstract to talk about analyzing character development and characterization. But then when you actually have to get into the head of a character to understand how they're going to make decisions and things like that, it becomes much more concrete. It becomes something you can grab onto because you've seen how that process works. So then when they have to go do character analysis or setting analysis or conflict analysis in the final exam, they have experience with it already. So in that way, it also ends up connecting your course um, outcomes, your student learning outcomes and core objectives to the assets the students already bring, which they, our students are very creative, they're very innovative, they're very entrepreneurial. And so it allows them to apply those assets that they already have to the course requirements um, and the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, at the same time, you know, we know that creation is um, you know at the highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So while the you know course outcomes may ask that they just demonstrate that they can analyze, this uh, allows them to be able to analyze, to adapt, to evaluate, and also to create in a way that carves out a space for self-authorship. Um, so they get they're really really proud um, when they turn these assignments in. Um, and then finally, you know, again, depending on your course, on your subject matter, it, it really has the effect of empowering students, again, not just to see themselves as a student, a lowly student, but as a historian, as a writer, as a civic leader, as a literary critic, as a psychologist, because they're applying what, they, what they've learned to what the career is. And I think that it also allows them to kind of try on different fields in ways that you know, a sort of strict um, uh, essay or testing kind of uh, framework doesn't necessarily allow for. So those are the two assignments that I wanted to talk about this time. And we are now ready to open up to questions, uh, to any Q&A. So again, if you have questions, you can type them in the questions pane or you can use the hand raise feature on your GoToWebinar control panel and I'll unmute you and you can ask us a question directly. And actually, while we're waiting on people to formulate their questions, I had a couple of questions for you, Dr. Castillo. Sure. Um, one was, I noticed that you had said that you actually spend a whole month on um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book. Um, how does that, how are you, I guess my question I have is because I always feel like I'm having to fly through material. So it seems like kind of a luxury to be able to spend a whole month um, on a book. So I'm curious about two things. One, what is the student response to that? And two, um, how are you able to fit in all of your material for the semester when you're spending so much time on one source? Uh, when I use the coach book, I, I have another film assignment. It's merged into a film assignment. And the I film see. is trash. The movie oh, trash. yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it kind of fits in. It dovetails in the questions because trash is about bias. Trash is about race relations. Price crashes about uh, how Hollywood handles this. And, and you've got a multiplicity of characters here. You've got uh, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, woman that owns a little, the father who owns a little uh, gift shop. The girl goes to buy a gun. And then you've got the two mm -hmm. police officers. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you have uh, the, the two black characters at the very, very beginning of the film when they talk about. Uh, uh, about uh, Sandra Bullock and her husband. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so we got all these little issues, and they're watching, and they're, we're talking about that. So then we dovetail that into this particular film. That's how we handle it. So they're writing actually two papers in that month. That's really cool. You know what? Another film you might want to check out. It's on Netflix. Um, I think it might be a Netflix production, but it's called See You Yesterday. Um, and it's about these two teenagers who are really, really smart and they figure out time travel. 
And, um, but they are also growing up in the Bronx and it weaves in this whole thread of police brutality and seeing young men, you know, the impact of seeing young men from a particular community dying and things like that. You may want to check it out because it might be, it might be another one that you could tie in. Uh, for Reina Grande, uh, I would, uh, I've used film. I always use film in my classes. Uh, the films that I've used are uh, giant. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've I used those films in, in class and to, to great advantage because the students begin to kind of uh, dovetail with the reading. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember last, I think last time I talked about that book, uh, profound book, historical book called uh, uh, Anglos and Mexicans in the Making of Texas. Montejano's book is one of our CPN uh, scholar mentors. Uh, I've used that book and I've used Giant, and the students are amazed at how everything dovetails. And I've used mm -hmm. that for writing and for visual because students like visual, they like to see things, they want to see, want to see how it connects. And yeah. uh, that, that particular movie, Giant, has the ending scene at the Sergeant's Cafe, and I've had students uh, who tell me they were very, very taken aback by it. Uh -huh. we talk about that. That's where the visceralness comes in in terms of uh, what uh, happens in Sarge's cafe. Uh, mm -hmm. That's right. And we have another question for you, Dr. Castillo. Um, Dr. Chavez, actually, let me see if I can unmute her if she has audio. Uh, Dr. Chavez, you're unmuted now. Would you like to ask Dr. Castillo your question? Excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, great. Hello, thank you both for the uh, webinar. Very insightful. Uh, Dr. Castillo, I had a question for you and I had a question for Lydia. Uh, for you, Dr. Castillo, uh, I am wondering if you could teach uh, the first year class again, the integrated reading and writing. Uh, what three books would be the key books that you would concentrate on? Um, given the times. Um, okay. Actually, uh, for INRW, I, I really would use Rina Grande's book because it's, it's not fiction and, and, and it, it really resonates with them because it's easy to read, fast read, and it's written at the eighth and ninth grade level. So it's, it's really good reading. And the second book I would use, of course, is. Uh, what Lydia mentioned, uh, Tomás Rivera's book, You No Se Lo Trago La Tierra. Easy reading, there's little time to vignettes, and these vignettes offer an opportunity. So now you have, uh, I've done male, female, male, and then one more female, which is Sandra Cisneros, uh, the uh, woman hollowing tree. Uh, and these books I would use for INRW because they lend themselves to fast reading, real short, not long, 38 page chapters are real fast and you can write real quick items in some of these because the students have a chance to really write. And I think I last time I, I had some examples of some of my I know W students they're writing that and they're really, really uh, improved because they're writing a lot. And I, I I do use journals a lot. They have to write they have to keep journals. And then journal writing allows them to reflect on paper. I, you know, and I tell them this, you, you select, uh, I want you to write, you know, like so many pages a day, and you tell me what section you want me to read. So it gives them, it empowers them to select whatever section they want me to read. And from there, they, they print it. And I, say, I hope that answers the question for those people. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I thought some of the new people may appreciate knowing that. Uh, Lydia, you talked about the difference in rhetoric versus narrative analysis. Do you have any sources you can recommend to our listeners? Um, well, for um, for the rhetoric, for the rhetorical analysis class, I use uh, it's a it's a press paperback. Uh, it's called "Thank You for Arguing" by Jay Heinrichs. And I use that because he uses a lot of pop culture references. And so he explains uh, ancient rhetoric 
uh, which I love the ancients. And so he explains ancient rhetoric um, in a really accessible way that students um, uh, that students really like. And it also has the added benefit of um, since it's in a new edition, the first edition is actually uh, almost always available, the whole thing in a PDF online. And so um, so I'm able to kind of pick and choose chapters uh, from it to use uh, for that class. Who's for the author, did you say? J, J-A-Y, J Heinrichs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for arguing is the title of that one. And um, and for narrative analysis, I usually just put together my own materials. So I do little, I have a series of video lessons that I've compiled um, that I, that I um, sort of, I assign some of them, uh, but now I do more of a hybrid model where I'll introduce like the various narrative elements in class and then now I just assign the video lessons for extra credit because students weren't watching them. <laughs> um, but what I'm uh, moving more towards this year is um, uh, something along the lines of what um, Allegra has talked about in the past with uh, sustainable assignments. And so um, I'm moving more towards having students actually uh, write the descriptions of the narrative elements or, you know, in their analyses of particular uh, narrative elements from particular stories, they would serve as a sort of little introductory notes uh, for future classes. Hmm. So, so I don't use a particular text for narrative analysis. Well, great. If you can add any of those resources to the um, to the documents that you're sharing, I would appreciate that. Okay, definitely. Uh, the one, I guess, the one major resource that I do use for that class is uh, it's called LiteraryDevices.net, and so it just has um, a little, it's you know, little entries for particular literary techniques and uh, narrative elements, literary elements and things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we also have a question here from uh, Cesar Diaz. I'm gonna see Cesar if you have audio. Do you wanna test real quick? Hi there, I, am I, am I uh, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, my question that I had is, um, I really love uh, uh, the assignments that you have put together here for uh, the classes. And I had a question about the creative adaption assignment. Um, you were talking about how the creative adaption assignment, like the, the things that they come up with helps them in putting in, in uh, um, understanding how to analyze uh, uh, the sets, you know, like the elements of fiction. And mm -hmm. like my question was, uh, um, do you have like a set of guidelines that you give them for them to recognize it within their own writing as far as like to be able to actually put it, you know, like to understand, like, let's say uh, um, conflict is here, right? This is the, the, mm -hmm. the type of conflict I have or my character is a fully developed character that is complex and here's why. Like, do you have like any, like, like how do you approach that in, in the introduction uh, of these elements to students? Yeah, that's a great question. So I basically, with the two stories that I mentioned, or the vignette, Cuando Lleguemos and the, um, the Tatting Man, so those are the two stories that kind of lead us into this last unit. And um, with those, instead of approaching the discussion for those stories as, you know, like, either close reading or, you know, an analysis of some element or something like that, because we will have already been, you know, we've already been doing that for the, you know, 10 weeks or so leading up to this assignment. Okay, um, okay. So for the discussion for those texts, um, I ask them basically, and so in their familias, in their small groups, I ask them to come up with, to basically brainstorm any adaptations that they can to, let's say, when we arrive. And mm -hmm. so I tell them, you know, select one of the narrative elements and change it. And then I have, then they come up with a bunch of them. I tell them, pick their top three 
and then each familia goes and presents on it. And so just by hearing the different ideas that come up in that discussion, they just they start they start just really generating um you know all of this electricity <laughs> their yeah, minds yeah. go you know their minds just go wild um with the possibilities especially you know there will always be some familias that will be really tame like oh i would like to know more about this character like you know i would do a backstory for this character and then they'll see some groups that are like oh let's make them be going to mars or, <laughs> or something like that you know and then they'll go, oh, whoa, I didn't know we could go there, you know? And so then just hearing all the different ideas. And so then we do something similar, but on uh, an individual level with the tatting man. So I ask them to generate their own ideas and to start writing, you know, okay. Okay. to start basically like, you know, brainstorming in writing how they would do it. Um, and so with that one, it's, um, you know, I feel like with the analytical essays um, that precede it, really the main time for uh, sort of groupthink and crowdsourcing is in peer review. Um, but with this essay, uh, I shouldn't even call it an essay, with this creative ad adaptation piece, they, I, one unintended um, effect was that while they would be writing. Oh, the other thing I do with this one is I build in uh, two extra, I build in two, or I dedicate two full class periods to uh, workshopping the stories. Okay. So they have two full class periods to be actually writing. And what I found is that they would be showing each other their work and they would be like talking about like, okay, like how, what are the different ways this scenario could play out? And what would yeah. she say here? So they're all like brainstorming collectively. You're thinking, you're thinking like writers. That's exactly, ah, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for your question. And we are actually coming to the end of the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and go, um, to some announcements, catch the next announcements. I wanna say thank you to um, all of you who were able to attend our fifth annual Student Transfer Motivational Conference earlier this month. Um, if uh, we did create an alumni workspace wiki there, and so if you would like to refer any of your alumni to that, you can contact Stacy Ibarra at stacy.ibarra at catchthenext.org. Uh, we also want to send a particular thank you to San Antonio College for the English PD session that they had earlier this week with Allegra. Also, everyone, please save the date. We have um, the information for our Fall Ascender Seminar. It will take place October 25th through 26th at the Hotel Indigo Riverwalk in San Antonio. So please um, make plans to attend that. And finally, any new any college with new faculty who haven't yet been trained, uh, please feel free to contact Allegra Villarreal at allegra.villarreal at catchthenext.org. And I wanna say a special thank you to Dr. Castillo for taking the time to um, show us, share with us some of your wisdom and your experience in teaching um, culturally relevant materials. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Um, again, we will not have a webinar in July, so we will see you again in August. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.